Uh, Romans chapter 12 and 2, it reads like this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. A whole message is tucked into behavior and customs and how those are intertwined and how we get to that. But let God transform you into a person by changing the way you think. So if I think new thoughts, I become a new person. Right? If I can't control my thoughts, then I can't control what I do. But if I can start to lead my thoughts with, with a healthy mind, lead and feed my thoughts correctly, then I can become the healthy person that God has called me to be. Right? And here it says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I think there's everyone in this room, uh, whether in your conscious mind or your subconscious, you want to know the good and perfect and pleasing will. And not only know it, be able to walk in it. And this right here becomes the catalyst for us to be able to, to know and to step into that. It is the renewed mind. It is a mind that is being regenerated and renewed. And this doesn't happen by chance. This happens on purpose. And that's why we're plowing through this subject of mind monsters. So I want to ask you to bow your heads with me, and we're going to pray. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to teach you today. Heavenly Father, we honor you. We thank you for your goodness and your word. We thank you that your word can teach us and instruct us to, to walk out this faith and to become more like you. We're being changed from glory to glory, from faith to faith, into your image. And we honor you. Let the living word preach the written word. Let the word fall into good ground and bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen, amen. All right. So we're talking about the mind. We're talking about mind monsters. And we've, we've labeled this mind monsters because you cannot defeat what you cannot define. And you can call it whatever you want, mind monsters. You can call it stinking thinking. You can call it whatever. Uh, thoughts that are not compliant with Christ, you can call it whatever. But we have to define it so we can defeat it. And this doesn't happen casually. It's something that is a battle, and it's an on going battle. Here's why it's important, because what comes into your mind will ultimately come out of your life. What comes into your mind will ultimately come out of your life. You are where you are today because your thoughts brought you here, and you will be tomorrow where your thoughts take you. Your thoughts set the stage, the pattern for what you will be and who you will become and how you will act and how you will respond. And life is not measured in minutes, it's measured in moments, and you don't get those moments back. And if you take the wrong mind into the right season, you will fall, you will falter, you will miss, you will hit the ceiling because your mind has not caught up to what God has done in your heart. That's why it's incumbent upon us as believers, as Christians, to make sure that we are highly, highly purposeful about the way we think. So watch this. Romans chapter 7 and, and 22 says this. I love God's law with all my heart. How many would just raise your hand and if you would say, I love God's law with all my heart. How many here would just, I love God's law. Like in my heart, I love God's law. Okay, there's a lot of us here that love God's law. But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. So there's a disparity between my heart and my head. My heart got saved, my soul got saved, my soul got washed, but my brain is still the same. Can I get an amen? You got that new heart and you got that old brain and they are not computing well, right? And so this is, this is where we have to be intentional about, again, feeding our mind, about making covenant with our eyes, with, with, with meditating on the right things, with filling our mind with things that glorify God and that bring me closer to walking a life that's not duplicitous, a heart that's good, a head that is corrupt. And so as we walk this out, we realize that this is something that has to be intentional. 
you have to be intentional about it. Because if you don't get this, if this if this doesn't become the thing that you fight for, if this doesn't become the battle that you're willing to wage, then the culture of casual will get into your heart and you will just throw your hands up and be a pacifist in this season. And guess what? If you're a pacifist, there's a lot more bad news coming your way. There's a lot more filth on its way than the good that's coming your way. There's a healthy stream and diet out there of bad news and propaganda and all kind of stuff that you got to guard your mind and guard your heart against. Because the world is, is built in such a way that wants to tear us apart, that wants to turn us like Cain and Abel toward each other and fight and destroy one another. And if we don't protect our minds, we'll succumb to the spirit and the culture and the customs of this world. So the question is, 50,000 thoughts going through your brain every day, who's in charge of those? Are you? Who's the gatekeeper? Who's the one doing the auditing? Who's the one looking at those thoughts and go, uh-uh, uh-uh? You don't belong there. The Bible says this is a battle. It's the battle for the mind. It says that we're to take captive every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ, that I can't just let everything run through my brain that wants to run through my brain. At some point, i got to say, stop it. That doesn't belong there. Came across an old sermon uh, from an old preacher many moons ago, and it was entitled this, One More Night with the Frogs. Has anybody ever heard that sermon before? One More Night with the Frogs. You have, Kevin. It's a classic one more night with the frogs. And here's the whole sermon summed up. Are you ready? It's, it's the fourth plague in Egypt. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, if you don't let the children of Israel go, there's frogs coming. And the frogs come and they go to every, they're in the kitchen. They're in the palace. They're in the bedrooms. They're everywhere. Frogs, frogs, frogs. And this is the whole point. Is Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, all right, let the people go and we'll get rid of the frogs. And he says, fine, whatever, well, just get rid of the frogs. He goes, when do you want them gone? And Pharaoh says, Tomorrow. Instead of saying today. So the whole sermon is one more night with the frogs. But here's what I want to tell you is that you've got to be intentional about what's running through your life. You can't let the frogs, you can't let the thoughts, you can't let stuff just get everywhere. You 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 gotta say, you gotta say, this is my mind and it belongs to God. This is my life and it belongs to God. And as my thoughts go, so my life goes. In fact, I want to submit this thought to you, that your life will go in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Your life is going to go into the direction of your strongest thoughts. We have 80 words a minute that we think. It doesn't stop. Trains of thought. And yet, we can't do this by just being passive. You don't become a Christian with a renewed mind by sitting in church, just like you don't become a car by sitting in a garage. It takes intentionality. So turn to your neighbor, give him a fist bump, and say, we're doing this on purpose. Now, some of you remember the scene in Gladiator where he's got his hand and he's touching the wheat. And I want you to picture a wheat field. I want you to picture a field that the wheat is is tall. And I want you to picture a man uh, or a woman walking through that field and happen to kind of put their arm through and kind of step through that field. And they're walking through the field. And when they're done walking through the field, you look back and you can see kind of where they went. You can see the wheat as it's kind of, kind of pulled to each side. And then they walk again down that same little walk and it pushes back more. And over three or four times, now it becomes wider. And all of a sudden... This little, this little uh, expedition becomes now a pathway, and it becomes easier to go that way. It becomes faster to walk down this path that can soon become a road. It becomes wider, and now others can walk with you, and it becomes a highway because you walked it again and again and again and again and again. And all of us in this room, we have thoughts that we have thunk so much that they become highways in our minds. There are paths that are so easy to walk. There are defaults to how you act and react that if not audited and if not taken captive, say this is not the way of Christ, this is not the truth of God, then ultimately you will succumb again and again to what is easy and what is casual and usual. What I'm submitting to you is this, is that this battle is one that is ongoing, and it doesn't stop. There's a concept of baptism. We have 
uh, baptism here, and we would love for you to consider, really consider, really pray about being baptized. It's not a suggestion. It is a commandment, and it's something that, that we're, as believers, to participate in, like, like be baptized, like, like submerge and immerse yourself in this calling, and it's something big. And at the end of every service, you can go to our service pastors that are in the tent in the Connect Center and meet them and talk with them about baptism. But, but baptism in all of its applications, we're, we're buried with Christ and we're united with Christ and, and uh, it's a confession of, of, of what's happening in our lives and it's, it's a public confession and all that good stuff. It, it also represents something else. It represents the idea of immersion, to be like swallowed up, to be fully inundated. That when a, belief, when a non-believer becomes a believer, that we are to submerge ourselves into this walk. Why? Because we bring this old mind into this new life and this new relationship with God. And if we don't surround ourselves and immerse ourselves with the right books and the right thinking and reading the Bible and the right people, then we'll never shake it. The first year or two are so crucial for your spiritual formation that you can't just casually tiptoe into this. Like if you're a new believer here, I want to I wanna implore you to take the plunge and go all in and, and, and go gangbusters and say, I, I'm not joining one small group, I'm joining two small groups. Like I'm going to put the Netflix aside for a little bit and I want to get my Bible out so I can start thinking the way that God thinks. And if you don't do that, then this casual relationship will become something where we try to marry an old mind and a new heart. And you'll have this consternation and frustration and duplicity in you. So, so, so get baptized in water, yes. But get baptized in the church. Get baptized with believers. Get baptized with the Word. We need a new mind, and we can't be casual about it. So today I want to talk to you Last week we talked about doubt. This week I want to talk to you about guilt. I want to talk about guilt and shame because this subject isn't talked about a lot. It's not processed well. Christians don't know what to do with this. We think that just because we're forgiven that the, the guilt thing should be just taken care of. And there's a process of how this all works out and pans out. I want to give you three principles to, to work through this. My, the first principle, I want to talk about lies. Everybody say lies. I want to tell you a, a little, little history lesson here. I want to show you, these are called SRBs. It's a picture of a spaceship. And uh, these are called SRBs. These are spaceship rocket boosters, these guys right here. And the purpose of these rocket boosters is not to get into space, not to go to space. It's to get the ship into space. Does that make sense? So the rocket boosters are all about boosting the rocket, right? And... Uh, Getting, getting that ship off of the ground, through the atmosphere, into space. And once you get into space, you're, you're good, right? And so NASA is working on the spaceship, and the spaceship has to be at a size that the rocket boosters can take it up. So it's all in proportion to how big, how big can the spaceship go? Well, how big are the rocket boosters? And so it was interesting because when they started designing, they realized that where they were going to be built and where the launch was were on two different parts of the continent of North America. So they had to figure out how to transport these, and they were going to transport it by rail. And so they were, the, the measurements for the rocket boosters were now ceilinged by the size of the railway. A railway from, from one rail to the next is four feet eight and a half inches. And so they said, four feet, eight and a half inches, we can maybe get away with like five feet to get this thing down without, you know, hitting the walls of some tunnel or something. But it was, it was basically, those were the measurements that dictated how large these SRBs were, okay? So somebody in NASA goes, well, that's crazy that our whole space program is kind of dictated on how wide the rail is. So they said, where does the width of the rail come from? And so they started researching and found that the length of our railway system here, the width of uh, from rail to rail, the four feet, eight and a half inches, comes from the expatriates who came from England who first started helping build 
the railways here in North America. And so they said, well, they're because in England, that's the width. Okay, well, where did England get that width? Well, they found that England got the width of their rails because of the width of their trolleys. And the people that made them used the same gouges and, and gauges. And so they had these instruments that set them, and that's what they used. They said, well, where do the trolleys get it? Well, they come to find out that the people that are making the trolleys were also making the horse and buggy. And they were using the same jigs and the same axles, and so it's the same width as these ruts that were all in the road. Back in the day, they had ruts, and you had to get it right because if, if, your, if your wheels on your buggy wasn't right, then you would break, break a wheel. How many done ever done Oregon Trail? Remember you had a, that little video game, you had to buy a, a wheel? Right. Some of you remember that. Good times. And so the ruts, and so they asked the next question. Okay, we, we got it. The ruts. Where did the ruts come from? Why are they this size? And so they go back, and, and they trace it all the way back to Rome and the chariots of Rome. And they said the chariots pulling, two horses pulling the chariot, these warriors who back 2,000 years ago came to Britain are the ones who forged these roads and it started with their chariots. They said, well, why was the chariot four feet, eight and a half inches? And they ultimately came to this conclusion, that it's because it's the width of two horses' hind ends. <laughs> two horses' hind ends that became ruts, that became rails, dictated how big our space program could be. What's the point? I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the point. Is that everything has an origin. This is point number one for today. Everything has an origin. And I want you to hear me. Every sin has an origin that is rooted in a lie. A lie that you have embraced, that you have believed, and you may not even realize that you believe it. Or have embraced it. Like as we boil it down, Adam and Eve, their sin, if we trace it back, the anatomy of a sin began with a lie. Did God say, God, you will not surely die. Here's what you've got to ask yourself. In every area that you're suffering, in every area that you're failing, in every area where sin has a, a, a stronghold in your life, you have to ask this question, where and how am I not trusting God in this? Because it's rooted in a lie. I'll give you a couple examples. First example. The action, stealing, conniving, cheating, backbiting, embezzling, stepping on people to get ahead, to get that little at work or whatever it is. That's the action. That could be, you know, it could be a myriad of those actions, whatever. But it's rooted in some lie. And I'll give you an example of what that lie could be. It may not be this lie, but it could be this lie. I'm somebody if I have something. Stuff will make me happy. Stuff will give me security. Stuff will give me significance. And so somehow we measure our lives by the wrong finish line, the wrong dream. And we believe a lie about what, what happiness looks like. And all of a sudden, now our morals come down. Now our standards come down because we take advantage of a situation. We commit sin based, rooted in a lie. I'll give you another one. An action. Flirting. Illicit and inappropriate relationships. Sleeping around. But it's just our generation. It's just the way the kids are today. It's rooted in a lie. It could be this lie. It could be many lies. Satisfaction and acceptance will only come when I give people what they really want of me. I want acceptance. I want satisfaction. And I want that attention. It's rooted in a lie. Another one would be uh, hurt yourself, cut yourself, flirt with suicide. The lie could be this. You have no value. No one cares. No one knows. No one cares how you feel. You're looking for attention. You're looking for empathy. But no one cares about you or what you're going through. It's a lie. And the root of every temptation and the root of every sin, you could trace it back to a lie. We had our, our nephew, 
in uh, Santa Rosa. We beg him to come. He's in L.A. He's in college. He knows everything about everything. We love him. Josiah, if you're watching, we love you. Um, well, we finally got him to come visit us uh, this summer. He came for like two and a half days. And so he was, he was going to leave that day, and I woke up, and I was coming to the church, had a meeting. It was like a Wednesday morning. I said, I said uh, hey, Joey, man, do you, do you have to go back? Yeah, I got to get back. What do you got to go back to? Uh, I was like, you don't have to go. You can stay here. Come on, bro. He's like, oh, no, I got to get back, Uncle. I got to get back. I said, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go grab your keys. You're not going anywhere. So I walk downstairs. I don't grab his keys, and I go do whatever. I'm here at the church. I'm meeting, whatever. Like three hours later, four hours later, my phone is just lit up. I'm like, something's gone down. Like something wrong. Someone's hurt. Someone's in the hospital. This is too many phone calls. My wife has called me. Josiah's called me. Joey's mother, Heidi's sister, has called me. They're like, why did you take it? He's got to go to L.A. I was like, I didn't take his keys. They're there at the house. Oh, Joey, did you check the place you put your keys? No, Uncle. All right. You don't know everything yet, do you? The last place. He was stuck at home, couldn't leave, not because he didn't have keys, but because he believed the lie. I hate to use me as the example of the guy who lied, but it still works, all right? <laughs> Here's what I want to say. Some of us are locked in a prison, and the only key to unlock it is to unlock the lie. Like it was the lie that was keeping him. He thought he couldn't go. He had all the access. He had everything he needed to get out of town and boogie. It was the lie that incarcerated him. And there's some of you who are stuck because you've believed the lie. You believe the lie. The second point I want to give to you today is this, is that you may have failed, but you're not a failure. And the enemy wants to define you by your mistakes. He wants to label you. You don't just fail. You didn't just fall. You didn't just mess up. You are a mess up. He wants to take your infirmity and he wants to make it your identity. He wants you to own it. He wants you to take it because the guilt and the shame, I got to do something with it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to your neighbor, left or right, whichever one you choose is fine. The person next to you won't be offended if you choose the other person. And I want you to say this. I was not built for guilt. All right. Here's the bottom line. You and I, when we make a mistake, okay, there's, there's two kind of things. There's conviction and there's condemnation. Conviction comes from God. It's His goodness, and it brings us back to Him. Thank God we feel, oh, my goodness, I shouldn't have done that. But then there's condemnation. Condemnation is another kind of, uh, of guilt. It's a guilt that tells you there's no hope. It's a guilt that doesn't point you to Christ. It, it, it moves you away from Christ. It's a, it's, a, it's a guilt that runs to the bushes like Adam and Eve and tries to hide from God. That's the kind of guilt we're talking about today. Is that okay? Here's the problem. You weren't built for guilt. In, in, your, in your constitutional makeup of who you are as a child of God, created in the image of God, there is no place to put guilt. We're given guilt and then all of a sudden... We have to figure out how to do something with it because there's no place to put it. There's no, like, pocket for it. So either we have to take it and bury it deep inside of our spirit and compartmentalize it and internalize it. A lot of people do that and become sick. Or we project it on everybody else. I'm a loser, so you're a loser. I'm broken, so you're broken. we got to throw it on somebody else. I've learned my wife is... Um, whenever she invites me to go to Cheesecake Factory in Corte Madera. This doesn't happen often, but once or twice a year she'll be like, hey, you want Cheesecake Factory in Corte Madera? I'm like, you had me at hello. You had me at hello. So we'll go to Cheesecake Factory. We're done with Cheesecake. She's like, hey, you know, I'm going to sneak around and go over to uh, Anthropology. I said, oh, yeah, Anthropology. Yeah, they have a class at the JC called Anthropology. You can take it, and we'll sign you up. No, no, there's a clothing store. And what ends up happening, I realize, 
It wasn't her wanting me to have cheesecake. There was a plan. There's a plan. And the plan isn't permission. The plan is she needs someone to hold her purse and her bags. While she's trying on clothes, someone's got to be outside holding all the stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Guys, we get handed stuff, and I'm like, I don't, I don't have enough fingers to hold all these things. I got her purse. I got her, I got, I got her, her, her phone. Like, what happens if, like, something happens in there? Like, like the clothes monster just takes over and just, what ha- what, we don't, can't even get a hold of each other. And I've got the bags. And then there's always the other dudes, right, who are in the same position as we are. And you meet eyes, and you're like, we know. I know what you're going through. Just waiting for your wife to finish shopping. But you don't, what do you do with it? And, and sometimes, I, like, that's the same thing. When guilt comes, it's like, what do I do with this? I'm, I've got this guilt, and I don't even know how to deal with it. We weren't built for guilt. So I'm going to show you a remedy that, that God gave for this in the book of Leviticus chapter 16. He has a sacrifice that has two goats. One is killed. And the other is released into the wilderness. And these two goats represent two things. I'll show you a picture of these two things. The first one is blame. The second one is shame. You say, well, the, the, these, aren't, these aren't different. These are the same. No, no, they're not the same. They're different. I'll, I'll prove to you they're different. Because you can get in trouble for something you're not sorry about. And you can, you can feel shame for something you didn't get caught and get, didn't get in trouble for. So, there, so God deals with both of these. And in Leviticus chapter 16, he deals with them because he has two goats. He says, two goats are going to come, and one you're going to kill. The blame, the, 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 the price of your sin, there's going to be a death, and that death is immediately going to eradicate the penalty of sin. Done. And so when Christ died on the cross for you and I, guess what? We were immediately, unequivocally forgiven. We'll never be more forgiven than we are the moment that Christ died for us and we said yes through repentance to that work on the cross. Amen? Instantaneous, boom. Or as the kids would say, boom shakalaka, done. But how many of us have been forgiven and yet still feel guilt? So the work of Calvary is not one-fold, it's two-fold. Because we're dealing with blame, and then we're also dealing with shame. And so this is how he says it. He says, I want you to bring the two goats. You're going to kill the one. The blood is going to give you access, atonement. It's going to give you access again. It's going to give you access to all, all, of, all of the tabernacle, which represents the kingdom. It's going to give you access again. And, and, and that's the first step. Wonderful. But that's not it. You bring the second goat And the priest is going to put his hands on the goat, on his head. And you're going to start confessing all of Israel's sins. I mean, can you imagine how this experience is going to play out? Israel's waiting by and, all right. Okay, Susan had a bad attitude three weeks ago. Billy Bob, oh, man, he, was, he let his dog use the restroom on his neighbor's yard, and they got in a big brouhaha fight. It was just bad. Uh, this guy right over here, is just, he's got a lying problem. You, have, you do have a lying problem. Stop it. Stop it. And you just, I mean, they're just confessing sins. Confess it. And the whole function was to take the shame, the guilt, and to get it out of here and to put it onto that goat, that scapegoat. You've heard the term scapegoat. Oh, he was just a scapegoat. He was the scapegoat in the operation. They put all the shame on him. And now when you read his name, it's just shame, shame, shame. That's what a scapegoat is. And God says, here's what I want you to do. The work of Calvary, instantaneous, you're forgiven. But I want you to learn to start giving me the shame. Why? Because if you don't, here's what happens. You know what's going to happen? You're going to take that identity, and the enemy is going to let guilt, put that guilt on you. He's going to keep reminding you, and then you're going to define your life by that guilt. You'll never be able to get higher than that guilt. You didn't, just, you didn't just make a mistake. You are a mistake. There are many people in the Bible who didn't even have a name. There were people like Mary and whoever, but there were people like, yeah, uh, the lady with the issue of blood. Can you imagine being known by your infirmity? The lady with the issue, what's her name? Nobody really knows. We just know she has a real big issue. 
And if you're not careful, you'll, that shame and guilt will become your identity. You can't get past it. And so they put all that shame and guilt. They said, it doesn't belong on us. We're going to confess it. We've got to get it out. Why? Because your secret is your sickness. But if I can get it out and put it on Christ, then the Bible says, you don't kill them. You get somebody from the tribe, somebody from the house, and you get them to walk that goat out into the wilderness further and further. And as you see that goat, that shame, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're processing it through Christ. And we're saying he carries it. And all of a sudden, you can't see it anymore. It is gone. And God wants you to process your shame the right way. God wants you to process your shame the right way. Come on, turn to your neighbor, give him a high five and say, process your shame. In Jesus' name. That's number two. I'm going to give you the last one. This is the silver bullet. You ready? You want the silver bullet? Should we just wait? We can. We'll put, we'll put last services. Oh, thank you. Please, thank, it's Pastor Appreciation Day. Thank you. All right, point number three. Here we go. I'm going to give you a scripture, and uh, this is the silver bullet. This is it. This is, this is how we win. 1 John chapter 3 and 16 says this. Hereby... Perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. So this is about perceiving. Everybody say perceive. If you can perceive the love of God, I know this sounds so vanilla. Oh, the love of God. You're talking about the love of God again. How do you even measure that? How do I know the love? Whatever. Okay, this happens all the time, and it gets wa- these words, love of God gets washed out. Oh, aren't you thankful for the love of God? Yeah, thank you. Know, what does that even mean? And then we skip down to verse 20, 21. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. So he'll take care of us. We'll be all right. We're forgiven. If our heart condemns us, God's got you. But that's not what we want to end. He knows all things. But watch this. Beloved. Everybody say beloved. You're loved. You're You're beloved. You're his beloved. You're loved. If your heart condemns you not, then we have confidence toward God. When you walk in the confidence of God, anything is possible in the kingdom. This is where God wants you to be, in confidence. Now, let me give you this this little story real quick. Point number three. You ready? There's two guys at the Passover. Brother John, Brother Peter. Peter and John, okay? These are the guys. And I'm going to show you the difference in their perception about the love. Are you ready? We got the first guy. John the Beloved, whose head is nestled up in Jesus' bosom, and Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And John the Beloved looks up and goes, really? And all the other guys go, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Peter, is it me? Andrew, is it me? Jesus, is it me? And the guy with his head in Jesus, next to Jesus' heart looks up and goes, which one is it? <laughs> Think about that. Confidence. Why? There's a difference between the two, John and Peter. Peter had confidence in his love for Jesus. But John had confidence in God's love for him. And that was the difference. There's a difference. See, Peter goes, oh, Jesus, I would never deny you. I I would never, ever. And he starts singing this song, not really, but kind of. Like a boys to men kind of song. I will never leave you, forsake you. I would, Brian Adams, I'll die for you. Walk the line for you. You know it's true, Jesus. And this is, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll be here all week, folks. I'll be here all week. Okay. But this is what happens. Listen, listen. Jesus goes, no, you're actually going to deny me three times. Before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. But he also prophesies that he'd rebound. You're going to fail, but you're not a failure. When you repent and come back, help your brothers out. So, so you're going to fail, but you're not going to be a failure. Your confidence is just hidden in the wrong place. You're, caught. You're trying to prove to me how much you love me. I love you. I, I love you. And John, the beloved, is like, 
Oh, man, he loves us. In fact, you know John the Beloved, right? Like the Bible calls him John the Beloved. But you know what book is used, where, where that term is used? It's in the gospel according to John. John the Beloved. John the Beloved here. <laughs> Pastor the Beloved. How are you doing? I'm Pastor the Beloved. But what he had was confidence. Not in his love for Jesus, but in Jesus' love for him. And I'm loved. I'm so loved. That's why when the cross comes, the one who had confidence in his love for Jesus, he's denying Jesus. But the one who had confidence in Jesus' love for him, he's at the foot of the cross saying, oh, yeah, Jesus, I'll take care of your mom, whatever you need. He was there in mission, on mission, there, because his confidence wasn't in his strength. It was in Christ's love. Now watch this. I'm going to give you a verse, and we're going to sum it all up. 1 John chapter 4 and 10. Watch this. 1 John chapter 4 and 10, and we're closing. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Here is love. Not that you love, oh, I love, God. I love God more than you. I love God. How about you? We love God. Yes, we do. We love God. No. John the Beloved was not boasting about how much he loved God. He was boasting about how much God loved him. And this is the confidence that we receive. Our confidence is not in our ability. Our confidence is in God's love. And this is where the guilt becomes stripped away. And we become new creatures when we know and perceive the love of God. That's why. That's why. Jesus is baptized. He goes down the water, comes up. Heaven's open. What are the words? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Beloved is affection. Son is acceptance. Well pleased is affirmation. Affection, acceptance, and affirmation. And when you have those things, you can go through anything. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, you know what he did? He cut off beloved and he cut, cut off whom I'm well pleased. If you are the son of God. Why? Because the enemy's going to come in. Oh, yeah, your son. I want to cut off beloved. I want to cut off. I want to cut off the affection. I want to cut off the affirmation. I want to cut that out. I want to cut that out. No, no, no. You don't understand how much he loves me. And when you get that, it changes you. And when you get that, it's not all about breaking God's law anymore. It's about breaking God's heart. Something shifts in you. The desire to please the one who is pleased with you. He calls those things that are not as though they are. He calls you righteous before you act righteous. And now, all of a sudden, because he called you righteous, you start stepping into the righteousness of Christ. Something's changing. I start thinking like a beloved son in whom God is well pleased because he called me that first. Right where you are, would you bow your heads and close your eyes?